This is the Break of Dawn, and I am your host, Dawn Paul. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we are going to be talking about a subject that people don't want to touch. They don't want to talk about. We are going to be talking about sexual abuse. A lot of times, sexual abuse is the white elephant in the room. It's the subject that people want to avoid. But today, I am going to be talking to an advocate and two courageous survivors of sexual abuse, and they're going to be sharing their stories with us. And we are now joined by Sean Hubley. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. You are a survivor, right? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Not a victim. Not a victim. Right. Who was Sean at five years old? Go back to Sean at five. <sighs> Sean at five years old mm -hmm. was, um, I was in foster care. My mom was a drug addict. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we were in and out of foster homes quite a bit. And uh, a lot of foster homes aren't good. You know, yeah. there was a few in there. One where the lady had made us eat cat food for dinner. Mm. Um, another one uh, where I was abused um, and I had two other brothers so we weren't always put together so we were separated yeah. often because not a lot of foster parents wanted to take three boys yeah one was a man mm -hmm. and uh, just one night it was uh, he took two of us me and my older brother mm -hmm. and uh, he woke us up in the middle of the night and uh, I heard, uh, you know, he was running the bath water, and I uh, went in there, and uh, he undressed us, well, one at a time, and put us in a, uh, put me in a, in a freezing cold bath. It was freezing cold water, mm. um, to the point where, you know, it was so cold that, you know, you're shivering, and you can't think, you know, and especially being at a young age. Yeah. And you know, he began to fondle me, and, but, you know, being at that age, you don't know what's going on, and. What would be your message to the foster care system? You having been there yourself. I would say, you know, not only improve your, your application system and, mm -hmm. your, uh, and do a little more of a thorough background check, but make, I would make surprise visits. I would right. uh, go out and don't tell them that you're coming, go out and surprise them, check out the place so they cannot prepare for you uh, on an announced visit. That way you can, you can see, you know, uh, what they're doing, you know, and also, you know, take the child out, talk to the child, ask the child, you know, if they're at a certain age that they can hold, you know, a conversation. Talk to the children, yeah. you know, in the foster home. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, you were married. Yes. Uh, that was a difficult situation, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Talk a little bit about the, the marriage. The betrayal. The betrayal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, married. Uh, mm -hmm. Three wonderful kids. Yeah. Uh, I'm still with the kids today. I love the kids with all my heart, mm -hmm. all my soul. Um, but the marriage was great in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. Something went to the left or to the right. Um, I decided to help a friend out. And uh, he was in dire straits. So, you know, I decided to help him, you know, let me, because I have a big heart. Yeah. And I'm a very giving and caring person. So I brought him in to my house and let him stay with my house. And one thing led to another with those there, like I was, they, I was at home, sleep while everything went on. Wow. It was just. But see, what gets me, and you, I gotta say this is by the grace of God because you still have her children. You still are, the children are yours, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. St they're, yeah, not biologically, but. But, but still, yeah. they are, yeah. I have the children because Th nothing was their fault. Mm. It's yeah. not their fault. Right. Um, and I made a promise to them. Mm. I promised them that. Yeah. I promised them that I would always be in their life, yeah. no matter what. They deserve a father. You know, they didn't have their fathers. Yeah. So I didn't want them to grow up without a father. So. I. Uh, I, I was reading your bio and, and I was getting emotional because I have some things too I'm dealing with mm -hmm. uh, and I don't compare my story to anyone else's but when you have been betrayed by your mother, when you have been betrayed by caregivers, by friends, by a spouse, how do you open your heart again to say, I'm going to open my heart to a survivor mentality? Whew. When you are kicked around that much and, and you just, how, how do you tell yourself, I am going to be a survivor? I, I have to tell you, it has to, the only thing for me is God. 
yeah. in Jesus Christ. Yeah. I found God and uh, he, he helped me through. Um, but it's also a mentality. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't wish this on anybody on, on earth. So, you know, through my overcomings and, and the teachings that I get from my church, mm -hmm. New Light Christian Center Church, yeah. Bishop, I, he, he teaches you not only the Bible, but he teaches you application. Yeah. He teaches you how that, and he doesn't just say, oh, the Bible says you can be an overcomer. He teaches you how to overcome. The healing comes from the openness, doesn't it? Because a lot of men who have been sexually abused, it is this label that they put on you all. Mm. A man is supposed to be tough. He doesn't open up, right. he doesn't cry. Right. Um, but when did you say, you know what? I may have had a past, I may have been sexually abused, but I'm just gonna have to say it. What was that moment where you just shared it with the world? Well, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, I was a very open person. Okay. And I shared my testimony of the drugs and everything, but that was the one part I wow. capped out. Because well, yeah. I'm a man. Yeah. And, you know, I grew up in the 80s, yo. I know I look young, but I, I'm, I'm 40. I thought you were 20. Oh, I'm not talking to a 20-year-old? No, I'm 40 years old. Yeah, okay. yeah. By the grace of God. Well, hold on. They say black don't crack, but white don't crack either. No, I'm so, that's what I'm talking about. Go ahead. Yeah. Sean, we talked about Sean at five years old. Who is Sean now? Oh, Sean is Sean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sean is Sean. Yeah. Sean is very confident in who he is. Yeah. Sean is very happy with who he is. Mm -hmm. Sean is uh, loves to help people. Yeah. Um, I love what I do. Um, I'm in uh, ministry training to be a minister. Okay. Uh, because once again, I have this heart for people and I want to help people. Yeah. Um, but Sean knows who he is nowadays, yeah. and Sean has learned not to let his past dictate what his future is. How many years sober? Eight years. Eight years. Eight and years. counting. And counting. Right. Yes. And counting. And Eight counting. Eight years. I, I want you to to look at the camera and I want you to tell the viewers the men watching uh, or the women watching who are with men who have been sexually abused how they can be survivors how there is hope for them you can become a survivor if you want to be a survivor you have to want to be a survivor. You gotta get rid of that victim mentality. That's a must. You gotta stop listening to the negative people. Mm -hmm. You gotta stop listening to the people dragging you down. If they're dragging you down, you gotta get away from them. The word of God is powerful mm -hmm. for me. It is powerful because it's got life principles. It's not just, just, it's not just a bunch of stories. Yeah. And we are now joined by Mrs. Alyssa R. Jones, author, uh, founder, director of the Survivors with Voices Foundation, mm -hmm. another survivor, yes. right? Because when we talk about, Alyssa, the word survivor as opposed to the word victim, talk about that. Talk about the difference when you're dealing with somebody who has been through abuse. Yeah, dealing with somebody through abuse and the, it's really the mindset, mm -hmm. just as Sean said, because I think for me, mm -hmm. I had to really get to a place of really telling myself I've been through that. When did the abuse start? The abuse started at 11 years old. I was in fifth grade mm -hmm. and it went on for a, close to a year. It was a, a trusted person. Yes. Who, who was it? It was a, well, it was a man that my mother let rent the basement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, don't, I wouldn't say he was too trusted, but she was in a situation where she was going through a divorce mm. and was in between and needed financial stability. Yeah. And she thought that was the way to do so. But in a sense, it was like, she opened the, the, the door to a wolf in sheep's clothing. You mm. know, he played like he was nice. He bought me nice things. I, I can remember we had a great Christmas that year. Wow. But it was all, to me, hush gifts, you know, for me not to say anything. And I just, I was angry at her inside. I was upset at her because as a mother, and I knew she had been through abuse, mm. she didn't protect me. And I just didn't understand why. What was her response when you told her? 
I didn't actually tell her. How did she find out? I actually opened up to a friend. Okay. And in turn, that friend I felt was stronger than me at the time, and she told a counselor. And in turn, the counselor told my mother. But just sitting there looking at her and enduring the looks, you know how your mother just gives you those looks like, I can't believe you just said that. I can't right. believe I'm hearing this. And I just felt so ashamed. She never asked me what happened. And for the first time, I seen my mother be vulnerable. Yeah. I seen her cry and I seen her really wanting to go back to the past to save me. And from that moment, my heart opened up yeah. to her. Be because, and let me tell you, she has been through abuse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, I finally felt like I got my mom back. Okay. I finally felt like we can just work on us. Good. And at that moment where I just felt like everything was perfect, I had my mother, the unthinkable happened. And I was rushing to Ohio to mm. be by her side because she was fighting for her life. Yeah. And um, for me, it made me look at forgiveness a whole different way. I lost a lot of time being angry. Yeah. yeah. I lost a lot of time um, yeah. being upset. And I just, I wish every day now that I could take it back. Yeah. I wish that I just had one more day with her now. And it's like watching her drift into the hands of God those seven days. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was so much I had to say. I never knew I had to say, but it was like so much I wanted to say, so much I wanted to tell her. I wanted to tell her I love her. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell her I'm sorry. Yeah. And at this point, she couldn't hear me. And I just, I miss her every day. And I just, I, I wrote her a letter in my book yeah. and I just, but you know it's not, but but you know. Yeah. You've forgiven yourself for that though. Yes, right? I have. Okay. Because you, you have to. Yeah. You have to, right? Yeah. And you know that, right? Yep, and that was the first thing I had to do. Yeah. I had to forgive myself. Yeah. Let, let's move on to after, Alyssa before and yeah. Alyssa now. Yeah. And your husband, who yes. has been, you, you say, a great support system. Yes. Right? Um, describe him in one word. Oh, if you could love. Yeah. By any means love. Because after everything you've been through, he loved me past my pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because you all had some hardships. Yes. Um, talk about as a husband, because he's got to be a strong man. Because oh, one thing yes. we all know men think of, if they mm -hmm. hear that a woman has been ab sexually abused or, or raped, they think, oh, intimacy. Right. Does that mean I'm not going to get, you know right, what I mean? Right, How is right. that going to affect me in the bedroom exactly. if I marry this woman? Mm -hmm. How does your husband, because you have to be with a strong man right, to, to be able to deal with that. So talk about how he looked past all that other stuff and saw Alyssa for who she was and knew this was a woman <sighs> who even though been maybe a little broken, yeah. this was the one. No, I was broken, broken. Mm -hmm. I was double broken. Yeah. <laughs> and I say that because not only with dealing with the abuse, yeah. but really learning who I was. Yeah. I didn't know who I was. Yeah. And and I had been married before. Mm -hmm. And so when you don't know who you are, you can't love anybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But let, let's talk about the kids. How do you as a mother tell your kids mom has been abused? I'm going to be honest. What kind of conversation was that? Do they know? Have they... Uh, they don't know directly, they know indirectly. Okay. And I say that because um, my daughter, I'm very protective. Yeah. Very, very protective. Um, that's my baby. Yeah. I couldn't imagine if, if anybody would do anything to her that was done to me. And, um, I wrote a letter to my mother when I was angry, mm -hmm. and I, I told her, I said, if I ever was blessed with a daughter, she would know I loved her, mm -hmm. and I would protect her. And my kids are my joy. SWV Foundation, Survivors with Voices. Yes. Uh, how long has it been in existence? It's going on two years. Okay, two years. <laughs> but but I, I like the name of the foundation, Survivors with Voices. But but when that person walks in the door, yeah. man or woman, yeah. how does your foundation get them to from that victim mentality to hope, to survivorship mentality? Well, usually uh, when they come to me, it's from them hearing my testimony. Okay. 
Um, and a lot of times I have them come up and, and share. And mm -hmm. the first thing for me I do is I listen. I listen to the words that they choose right. to know if they're feeling as a victim or a survivor. Right. It's certain key words that you listen to. And if they're blaming themselves, then that they feel like they're a victim. Mm. If, you know, they're talking about, you know, they're, they're getting past it yeah. and they, they healed and they, they forgive their abuser and they could talk about it a little bit freely, then you know that they're on the verge of being a survivor. Okay. Um, and then with, with my foundation, I have the publishing company. And yeah. so basically, I put them through a program where they can even do more to use their voice okay. to have a published book, yeah. to be an independent author. Yeah. You know, whatever you want to do, because to me, I think using your voice is a step in getting your life back, yeah. taking your voice back and empowering yourself and empowering other people to, to be a survivor. And we are now joined by Ms. Tammy Hitmanek with the Children's Assessment Center. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for talking to us because this is a subject, it's the white elephant in the room. Now walk me through. Someone uh, says my child has been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. What happens when they walk through the door of the Children's Assessment Center? Typically, the Children's Assessment Center becomes involved um, when a family, a child reports abuse mm -hmm. and a, a call is reported to the statewide hotline. Um, then in Harris County, that case would come to the Children's Assessment Center if it involved sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. When a child comes to the CAC, typically the first step is a forensic interview. Mm -hmm. um, we have trained forensic interviewers who are um, trained to ask children questions about their abuse in a non-leading narrative manner because right. we want the child to tell us what happened from their words. We because it's different it. than when a detective who does murders interviews them. So you all have these yes. specialists who know how to talk to yes, children. Yes, we yeah. want to be very child friendly. Mm -hmm. um, we also don't want to lead the child. We want the child to right. use their own words. We don't want them to um, feel like we're, um, well, going back, the, the interviews have to be upheld in both criminal and civil courts. Okay. So um, we have to be able to make sure that we're not leading the child, that they're using their words and telling factual details about okay. what has happened to them. Okay. And so there's a lot of training on child development, mm -hmm. um, um, interviewing children who may have some kind of learning disabled mm -hmm. uh, disability, and so, so that you can get the best information about the child's accounts of their abuse. Okay. Now, you know, it's amazing to me how people see this going on. Mm -hmm. They see the sexual abuse going on, they know it's going on either in their own home uh, or at their church or, you know, they see it going on at a community center with a counselor or a trusted individual, but they don't say anything. And, and people, people need to get involved. People have to get involved. Right. Um, you know, and there's many reasons why I think that people don't want to believe mm -hmm. that it's happening, so they turn the eye to it. Mm. Um, other people are in situations where they're fearful mm. of reporting the abuse. Maybe the abuser is um, providing for the family. Mm -hmm. um, so they start to think of the things that would happen if they make that report. Um, children oftentimes don't tell about their abuse because they're threatened. Right. Um, because they feel responsible, they're ashamed and embarrassed. Um, but it is critical. Um, that if a person right. you know is being abused, or if you're being abused, that you you contact you tell mm -hmm. somebody that you know that you trust that can help you, um, because child sexual abuse mm -hmm. affects society yep. immediately. Not just let's not talk about what it does to that victim, but society. Um, there's more drug and alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, problems, there's suicide, a lot of mental health issues mm -hmm. um, that cost the community in the long run, um, more uh, problems in the, the justice system with um, people who have been abused um, who are serving time in jail. Um, there's reports that over 50 percent of women who were in jail incarcerated were victims of child sexual abuse, mm -hmm. eating disorder, teen pregnancy, yeah. um, prostitution. Mm -hmm. All of these are um, seen in children who've been sexually abused and have not received um, help to get past it. But another important thing and what I have found in doing my research is that child also can grow up to be that sexual predator. It, correct. Why is it, in your experience, you've, you've done this uh, for many years, why do some grow up 
to sexually abuse and then some don't? I, um, I've never experienced a child that I know of because mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of contact from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. But um, what I believe, mm -hmm. uh, it's just like being an alcoholic or suffering mm -hmm. depression or teen suicide or um, prostitution. They're not getting treatment. Yeah. Um, to learn healthy sexuality, yeah. um, to learn re to re respect them, their bodies and the proper respect of other people's bodies. Yeah, I, this is an epidemic. Sexual mm -hmm. abuse to me is an is an epidemic. Mm -hmm. But in when you do this kind of work and you see it every day, do you ever say, "Here's another one coming through the door"? Not in the sense that you're you don't want to help people, but you are just so sick of this epidemic epidemic being widespread. Do you ever get just tired and Y you know, well, I, I believe mm -hmm. that what we what we um, do here is so important right. and that if we help one child, mm -hmm. then we're making a difference for our society. Um, what you do, um, it appears that sometimes mm -hmm. you kind of lose hope yeah. in society that yeah. how can people really do this yeah. to kids? But yeah. it's very factual that it's out there yeah. and that that's what keeps us going here mm -hmm. at the CAC is because we can make a difference right. in children's lives. We can make a difference in the community by providing training for the community, pro providing training for schools, churches, so that they can make safer places. And if everybody talks about yeah. sexual abuse and everybody knows the signs and symptoms and what to look for, we're going to be able to find those, see those perpetrators. Yeah. Um, we have to make people comfortable with reporting. Mm -hmm. We have to make people know that sometimes it's a t you have to take a risk. Yeah. Um, sometimes you're not going to have the child come to you and say, this is what's right. happening to me. Sometimes you're going to know it before a child ever tells you, and you have to take the risk to make that report. And you might be right, you might be wrong, mm -hmm. but you're protecting a child. Yeah. The media, you know, we, we've talked, of course, you know, Michael Jackson was a, a rumor of abusing children. We had the Sandusky, you know, mm -hmm. Penn State. The media wants to talk about sexual abuse when it's a big, salacious story. Mm -hmm. But talk about how the media needs to, this needs to be, a, this is something that needs to be talked about, not just when it's a, a big story, but it's going on in the community, right. in your neighborhood. Right. right. It needs to be a discussion every day. Right. Um, you know, we see it on the news every mm -hmm. night. Yeah. Cases. Um, it never fails. There's a case about an inappropriate teacher student relationship yeah. or yeah. Um, the abduct abduction of a child, the rape of a child. Um, and, and to us at the CAC, the only way that the community can, can be involved is by um, becoming involved with organizations like ours that are mm -hmm. doing something to change by training people, by letting children know that they have a voice, by letting children know that there's a safe place where they can begin healing from their abuse. Yeah. Now, let's say you have that mother that walks in. She found out her child was sexually abused by a care, a, mm -hmm. a trusted neighbor or, or that babysitter. She brings her child in. How do you deal with that parent that is feeling guilt? Well, a lot of times when our parents initially come, mm -hmm. um, they themselves are unbelieving or they yeah. can't believe that this has happened to their child. And so one of the things that we do for our families is to provide education about child sexual abuse and mm -hmm. the dynamics of sexual abuse and the cycle so that parents can realize that it's not their fault. Um, you know, they didn't know the signs and symptoms, but then when they have look back, they can see everything that right. has happened and said, "Why didn't I see that?" Yeah. And so that's very common. But we have to we have to educate their parent to be a supportive um, person for that child from there on. Right. And do the right things from there on. Because I have, uh, you know, heard from parents talk to parents who say, "I can't believe this happened right. under my watch," and they need counseling too because it wasn't your fault. You right. didn't know. Right. So that's good. And that's one. Of, that's a great point that you bring up mm -hmm. because we um, believe in a holistic approach here at the CAC for treating child sexual abuse mm -hmm. victims. So we don't just treat the victim; we treat the non-offending caretaker mm -hmm. and the siblings. Yeah. Because oftentimes one child in the home will be abused and not the other. Yeah. Um, and so. So there can be a lot of animosity, mm -hmm. especially if the provider of the family then has to leave the home. Yeah. Mom or 
um, that has to be the provider, sole provider for these children now and has to work extra jobs. Um, there's two households to support if the perpetrator has to leave the home. Yeah. Um, and so if some of the children are not victims and one is, then they can be angry with the victim, yeah. which oftentimes can make a victim feel even more guilty. Yes. Um, slip into depression because they thought it was going to be better when they made a disclosure and now they're feeling repercussions from the situation going on in the house, yeah. which can oftentimes lead to a child recanting mm -hmm. um, and taking what they said back. And yeah. so we have to make sure that everybody in that house is getting the therapy they need to make that child healthy. Okay. Now, a lot of times we want to label these children bad seeds. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, little Johnny, he, he's a bad kid. But you don't know, Johnny could have been sexually right. abused. Right. So what are the red flags, instead of quickly labeling a child as a bad seed, what are the red flags you should look for well, in a child's behavior that they not, may have been abused? There's not one specific behavior, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things that you could see in a child that's been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. um, I like to tell people ch significant changes in behavior yeah. would warrant enough for you to talk to that child and what's going on in their life. And an example of that would be, you know, you have a straight A student and now mm -hmm. they're failing. Yeah. Or the child never missed school and was very eager to go to school and now it's they're afraid to go to school or they, they don't want to go to school. Maybe something's happened at school. Or they're afraid of a certain person all of a sudden or mm -hmm. a certain place, maybe the place where the abuse occurred. Yeah. Um, you know, um, changes in appearance. Yeah. Um, a lot of times young girls will see have begin having eating disorders because yeah. they're trying to disguise themselves, make themselves look unpleasant to a perpetrator so mm. they'll put on a lot of weight or wear sweaters and baggy clothes and things to just make okay. themselves less attractive to that person. Okay. Um, drugs, alcohol, yeah. risk, risk taking behaviors, okay. cutting on themselves. Um, a lot of different things would warrant um, you to be concerned about a child and then just talk to them. And that's why we always tell, another thing we tell parents is to talk to their kids often yeah. and start early about their bodies, mm -hmm. the appropriate names for their bodies, and then when it's appropriate, talk about child sexual abuse yeah. and child abuse and that these do, things do happen and you have to be able to to have that open line of communication with your kids so they feel comfortable talking and to you about anything. And that is the key because if you have a parent mm -hmm. who is like, don't do that, you know, you, you have to because in this society mm -hmm. things are so different right. for the younger generation. Exactly. You have to. Say and that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Open lines. Yeah. Open lines of communication and, you know, kids, you know, they do have my, so many much more me mm -hmm. opportunities for communication that we had is growing up like the social media mm -hmm. computers phones um, they know more about technology than we do yeah. and so you have to have that communication with your child and it has to start early and it has to be often so that you're checking in with them all the time so yeah. that if something's going on you catch it and you know yeah. Now we talk about stranger danger, you know, the schools put out the message, watch out for strangers. But what is the CAC's message that it's not strangers, it's uh, because the statistics have shown the abuser is, it's highly likely, well the statistics show that the abuser is mostly someone who yeah. you trust. So you know, when I was growing up it was the stranger danger. It was yeah. Like, the man in the van with the black trench coat at the park. Or the white van. It, white, yes, yes, the white van. Mm -hmm. And it does, it, that does happen still. We want people to recognize that there is that um, danger as well, but 95% mm -hmm. of the time it's somebody the child knows and trusts. Yeah. Um, it's somebody that has access to that child, um, that is able to build trust with that child and then ultimately abuse that child. Yeah. Um, and children are targets as well as families. Mm -hmm. Families become targets when, you know, like I said, if you have a single mother that's working multiple jobs mm -hmm. to provide for her family and her children, um, and those children are left alone, that's an example of a child and a family that's vulnerable. Yeah. And perpetrators are masters of manipulation and they look for those things and um, they prey on those type of children yeah. and those families. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm your host Dawn Paul and I want to thank you for watching The Break of Dawn today. I hope that what was said you were moved by it because sexual abuse is an epidemic. It is widespread all over this country. It's far too many people uh, that have been sexually abused as children than we know or that we want to admit. But if you or someone you know is being abused, don't turn a blind eye to it. Don't ignore it. Please, please get help.
I want to thank you again for watching, and until next time, have a good day.